Hi, welcome to another session of A Librarian's World. My name is Ronnie and I'm a researcher with the National Library of Singapore. In this session, I will be talking about the first Malayan emergency that took place from 1948 to 1960. Instead of focusing on the military aspects of the emergency, I will be looking at it from the human interest perspective. After saying how I got interested in this topic, I will give a brief overview followed by an introduction to the resources I have consulted and will later relate some stories that might be of interest to you. Some of you may be wondering why I have an interest in this part of Singapore's and Malaya's history. Well, when my cousin and I were young and mischievous, our exasperated elders would say, you guys are naughty like communists, or even frighten us by saying that they would bring us to the jungle and let the communists catch us. So I was wondering why they vilified the communists. And when I was a little older and going through my father's photo album, he pointed to me, someone whom he knew was murdered by the communists. That piqued my interest even further. And during my school days, I happened to pick up a book on the emergency and I just could not put it down as soon as I started reading it. What's the name of this book? Well, before I reveal what it is, let me give you some background information about the emergency. The emergency was declared on 18th of June, 1948, after three European planters were murdered by Malayan Communist Party or MCP guerrillas in Sungai Siput, Perak. Singapore followed suit on 24th June. Now, the overall aim of the MCP, led by Chin Peng, was to replace British rule in Malaya with communist rule. To counter the communists, the British implemented the BRICS plan, named after Sir Harold Briggs. It largely involved cutting off logistical and communication support to the communists by those squatting on the jungle fringes. These people squatted there during World War II to escape Japanese oppression, but after the war, they supported the communists, either willingly or otherwise. They were moved into new villages surrounded by barbed wire and protected by security forces. However, the British did suffer setbacks, most notably in October 1951, when the High Commissioner, Sir Henry Gurney, was killed in an ambush while on his way to Fraser's Hill. It was said that during the ambush, he walked out of the car to draw fire away from his wife, who was traveling with him. He was replaced three months later by Gerald Templer, who set out to win hearts and minds of the people as he knew that pouring more troops into the jungle alone would not solve the problem. In an attempt to end the emergency, both sides met in Baling, Kedah in 1955, but the talks failed. Okay, before I delve further into the topic, let me introduce you to some resources I referred to in my research. The book, The War of the Running Dogs by Noel Barber was a book I literally read from cover to cover a few times, and it became a launch pad for further research into the topic. Other books I referred to include Malia's Secret Police, 1945 to 1960 by Leon Comber, My Side of History by Chin Peng, and Iron Sp Spearhead by Peter Clegg, which I actually came across while browsing through the shelves at level 11 of the National Library. I also looked up books on interviews with Malay communists, other ex-communists, and a two-volume work which contains short biographies about some communists who were banished to China following their capture and an oral history account of her own life by communist curator Hit Li Ming, amongst others. I also consulted our NLBE resources, including Newspaper SG and JSTOR, which is a good resource for history journal articles. Let's now take a look at the impact of the emergency on Malayan civilians. When the British authorities went about rounding up jungle fringe squatters to resettle them in new villages, they did not give these villagers advance notice because they knew these people would tip off the communists and flee. So the authorities sent in their lorries unannounced and loaded them and their belongings and sent them off to new villages. People also had to carry identity cards like the one you see in the bottom left hand corner. Moreover, when they leave their villages, they would be searched by security personnel to ensure that they did not smuggle anything of value to the communists, especially rice and even cigarettes and coffee. Security personnel would also look out for telltale signs of smuggling, such as ladies who suddenly become pregnant as they were hiding rice in their undergarments. Severe penalties, including jail terms, awaited those caught smuggling items for the communists. During the emergency, there were incidents of buses being burned, rubber trees being slashed, and tin mines being sabotaged by the communists to wreak havoc on the economy. In addition, the communists would also maim or kill those deemed to be cooperating with the authorities. However, the security forces were not immune to committing atrocities either. The most famous case, or rather the most infamous case of which was the Batangkali incident in December 1948, 
in which 24 innocent people were murdered. There were also reports of security forces molesting women folk at the gates of new villages on the pretext of searching them for smuggled items. Let's now take a look at some more personal battles that took place between the adversaries, the first of which involved two women, Li Ming, the head of a communist Korean network, and her adversary, Detective Inspector Irene Lee from the Malayan Special Branch. The discovery of the existence of a network that stretched all the way from Singapore to Ipoh was made when security forces captured some documents in a communist camp in Selangor in 1952. Irene Lee, who was highly regarded by, by the Malayan Special Branch as well as her Singapore counterparts, was assigned to the task of unraveling it and apprehending its head. After following a trail that led from Singapore to places such as Yongping, Jerantut, and Kuala Lumpur, Irene Lee eventually arrested Li Ming in Ipoh in July 1952. Li Ming's arrest caused a media sensation and even the Hungarian government tried to intervene to save her from the gallows. However, she was eventually banished to China in 1963. While there, she helped look after her mother, who was banished much earlier for her communist activities until the latter passed on. She also met and married Qin Peng's trusted aide, Chen Tian, and they remained married until the, the latter passed away due to lung cancer in 1990. Li Ming herself passed away in 2012. As for Irene Lee, she joined the police force after her policeman husband, Jimmy Lok, was murdered by communist gunmen in Penang. After the capture of Li Ming, she was decorated for her work and held several posts in the police force before eventually leaving the force in January 1960 to work for a private firm in Singapore. Now, Singapore was not immune from communist subversion and attacks. A case in point is the story of Wong Fook Kwang, Elias Ng Ki Sun, Elias Tit Fung, or Iron Spearhead. He became the commander of E Branch, which was the MCP's assassination wing, after his predecessor left for the jungles of Malaya when emergency was declared. He was described as a formidable character, ambitious, dedicated, and ruthless. And his job was to kill collaborators and those deemed to be oppressing the people including rich businessmen like Lim Tek Kin. Apart from ordering the killing of Lim Tek Kin, Iron Spearhead was also responsible for the killing of a fellow comrade whose body was dumped in the swampy area of Serangoon and the attempted murder of a 14-year-old student who was alleged to have provided leads to the police regarding the acid attack on a teacher. The boy somehow escaped a hail of bullets and lived to tell his tale. His arrest was actually an unplanned event. A routine police spot check at an eatery in Albert Street near the present-day National Library building in Singapore resulted in his apprehension after a short chase. His identity was only discovered later at the Beach Road police station. While he was held in remand, he was discovered to have TB. He recovered but suffered a relapse later on and was warded in the prison ward of the Singapore General Hospital, or SGH. Following a visit by his mother on 4th March 1952, during which she must have told him about plans to help him escape, he managed to do so that night during a thunderstorm and made his way to Pasilaba in the western part of Singapore, where he stayed in a makeshift hut and posed as a farmer. The authorities posted a reward of $2,000 for his capture. He was eventually recaptured in July 1954. At his trial, there was insufficient evidence to try him on murder charges, but he was jailed for possessing banned communist literature and escaping from custody. He was eventually banished to China in 1956. While there, he got married and had two kids. But unfortunately, the marriage did not last, and Wong went about looking for the woman he first loved, and 12 years his senior. But sadly, by the time Wong got news of her, she had already passed on. Wong himself passed away two years later, in 2006. The emergency also split families along ideological lines, as was the case with two cousins, Dula Chekdat of the MCP and Yop Mahidin of the security forces. Both attended an Anderson English school in Ipoh and fought on the same side against the Japanese during the Second World War. However, while Abdullah embraced communism, Yoke chose to be with the security forces. Yoke actually asked his cousin to quit the MCP, but got a 0.45 caliber life bullet in reply and a note from Abdullah renouncing their kinship. Yoke was soon on the trail of his cousin and he very nearly killed Abdullah during a fight in the jungles of Pahang. However, Abdullah escaped because Yoke's bullet did not go off when he had Abdullah in his sights. The emergency ended in 1960, but the communists were not totally defeated. Another emergency was declared by the Malaysian authorities in June 1968, 
when a police convoy was ambushed in Crow, Vera. This emergency ended on the 2nd of December 1989, when representatives from the Thai and Malaysian governments met with the MCP and signed a peace agreement in Hachai, southern Thailand. Under this agreement, the MCP agreed to end the armed struggle, and in return, some ex-MCP members were allowed to go back to Malaysia, while others settled in peace villages in southern Thailand, which is close to the Malaysian border, like the one seen in this photo. As for Jinping, he was not allowed to return to Malaysia because of his role in the deaths and sufferings of many. He passed away in Bangkok in 2013. Well, thank you for your time and do join us again at our next session of A Librarian's World. See you.